you have your Bibles, um, get it, and let's go to the New Testament, and let's go to the Gospel of John. We uh, started last week and just tried to just share a little bit about Jesus said in Acts 1.8 that you'll receive power, everybody say power, power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that word power, we, we looked at, you know, not, not really in depth, but that word is the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get our word, English word dynamite. That that power is available, and we just looked at a few things. This isn't an exhaustive uh, discourse on the power of the Holy Spirit at all. But we've looked at a few things about what the power of the Holy Spirit can, can accomplish in our lives. And, you know, he's the revealer of things, right? How many of you know he'll reveal things to us? It, and what I'm not, talk, I, I'm not talking about turn us into prophets and, you know, that we look out into the field. I'm not talking about that. Um, but, you know, as parents, there's any young parent here or parents who are now old that you sure appreciated when the Holy Spirit <laughs> revealed to you what to do with your kid because you were stumped. The Holy Spirit can help us in those things. The, 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 the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Um, <clears throat> have you ever had an experience where just in the natural you had somebody try to teach you a concept and you marginally got it but then somebody else came along and taught the concept and the light turned on, right? Um, uh, well, the Holy Spirit can turn the light on every time. That's the cool thing. He can teach us. The, the Holy Spirit is our comfort. Um, in times of tragedy, in times of a crisis, um, we've all experienced the death of a loved one. Um, we've, we've, we've all experienced the pain that that sort of grief can kind of you know, bring with it. At the same time, the power of the Holy Spirit can come alongside us during those really dark times, and he can comfort. And, and you know, what I love to listen to later on, once a person has maybe gone through some dark days, I, I love to hear a testimony that they'll say, you know, in my darkest time, that I didn't know how I was going to get through anything. The world just collapsed around me, and you'll hear this this comforting testimony. But the, I don't know. The but but the Lord just seemed to bring peace to my soul. How thankful we are for that. Amen. If you haven't experienced a time like that, you will. At some point. I just want you to know Jesus had said that he wasn't going to leave us as orphans, um, but that he would send us his Holy Spirit. So the thing I want to clue in today on is is something that will become obvious here in a moment. So if you're in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, let's go down into that chapter, down to around verse 34 and 35. If you have a red letter edition, what does that mean, the red letter edition? Okay, it, it's, it's actual words of Christ speaking. He says, a new commandment. So let's just stop at that. So a commandment. What is a commandment? Is the commandment, is a commandment and a suggestion the same? They're not. One is a suggestion. You know, if you, if you think about it, if, if you ever get around to it, but if you don't, no big deal. But a commandment sets it, a, sets it aside in a place that says there's not an option, right? So now all of a sudden, if it fits that category that this is a commandment, now I'm, I'm forced with really one of two things. I'll obey or I'll disobey. Am I right? And at the end of the day, we can, we'll find out at some point, right? Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You know what? I just wish that as I have loved you, I wish it was not there. Are you with me? Because then I could qualify how I love you. Right? If it just said, you know, I I give you a new commandment that you love one another then I could set the parameters of what that love would look like. 
right? My, my parameters might be pretty narrow. Pretty narrow. My parameters might be pretty large. But Jesus put a qualifier on it that sets it again in a, another complete category. He said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Wow. I don't know about you, but in my flesh, that just isn't. Makes me just wonder, can I do it? Can you do it? Oh, that's good. Because some of you are out there going, nope. <laughs> good question. Good, not a good question, but that, that, those are good responses. It's like, so, so those of you who say, yep, yep. And those of you who say, no, hopefully come back to the same common point. It says, without the Lord, I can't. Or with the Lord, of course I can. Does that make sense? But the kicker is, is it's a commandment to us. So so we love, in New New Testament circles, we love to, we love to, you know, have kind of the idea that, you know, we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace, and so we would never articulate it this way, but we kind of have sometimes, if you're honest, the idea that, you know, I'll just try. He's a loving God, and he knows. Commandments, so the obeying of the commandments are no longer a deal. Okay, okay. But this says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, or to the degree that I have shown you, to the degree that I've done it, that you also love one another. <clears throat> wow. That's a mouthful of a verse. It really is. Because we define love so many different ways. I mean, we can eat a... Durant brought home some barbecued ribs last night, and I'm telling you, I loved those barbecued ribs. But that's really not quite the same as the love that I have for my wife. I mean, I tell her, boy, I love you, baby, and I sure love those ribs. (laughs) How many of those levels of love just aren't quite the same, right? Um, And then when Jesus qualifies it and says, as I've loved you, the way that I've loved you, how I've demonstrated my love towards you. So then think about that for a moment. Did anybody that Jesus rubbed shoulders with get weird or go wonky or just flat out evil and sinful? Of course, all of it. You can, all, all you have to do is read through the Gospels and look at all the people that, that, that Jesus came across and you've got everybody from manipulators to just phenomenally great sinners right that they're good at their craft you have it all and so when I then look at how Jesus showed his love towards people if we're honest all of us have to duck our head and say I failed are you with me because all of us have trigger points those of you that I know well, I know your trigger point, and boy, I could get a reaction out of you if I wanted to, right? When we was doing our rodeo camp, one of our, one of our rodeo instructors was a, was a legend in rodeo. His name was Deb Copenhaver, and he was sort of like my adopted dad, and uh, he rode during the golden era of rodeo with Casey Tibbs and all of that. And there was just a couple topics that was, De- that was Deb's uh, trigger points and if you wanted to get him to go on a rant he was the sweetest guy in the whole world could, and, and just just loved people and boy I tell you his love for the Lord was so great and he would just could cry at the do- drop of a if, if something happened to an animal or a horse or, or a person that was 
that was difficult, he would just cry and you'd just be around him and go slow. But there was not, that wasn't in all areas of his life. There was an area, in fact, I would just, if a new instructor came through, I'd, I'd just pull him aside and say, hey, ask Deb this question or make this comment and just watch little sweet Deb, you know, five foot nothing, just watch him come uncorked. And I tell you, it just became the funniest thing in the whole world because we'd be sitting down at, a, at lunch or whatever and, and you know, I'd kind of weak at the person. It's like, now's your time. And so they'd bring up a topic and sure enough, it was just hilarious. At first, Deb, you could see, would try to hold it in. And then I'd wink again or something like that, and the guy would go on, and then all of a sudden, Deb, Deb would just let it rip. So we might not let it rip on stuff, but what my point is, is there's trigger points in all of us that, that hinder or help us to love people. Are you with me? Right? I wonder if politics would be a trigger point. Just a thought. I was just musing. Okay? Could be. How about belief systems? Could be a trigger point, right? That just, you know, we're doing good until you mention that. Uh, I wonder, if, even for some, I wonder if a different culture or a different color of skin could be a trigger point. Could be. We all know these things shouldn't be. Are you with me? But how many of you know we hold this treasure in an earthen vessel? Right? Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another to the degree that I've loved you. And then look at the result. If we do that, by this, by what? By obeying the command to the degree that I have loved by this, all will know that you're my disciples. If, everybody say if. If you have love, what kind of love? The love that he showed, the way he showed it, and the way he expressed it and worked it out. If you have love for one another. My point is, is that there's a rubric here there's a, there's a system here to let us know instantly if we have succeeded or failed. I know today we kind of don't like those terms. Just show up to the race. It's like, you know what? On this commandment, just showing up doesn't get the job done. On this commandment is do it this way, and if you do, all will know that you're my disciples. The book of John, by the way, within Scripture, is the book that talks most about the love of God. Old Testament, the word loved, I think, is mentioned about 24 times. And the book, Old Testament is much, much larger than the New Testament, right? Right? Of course, we know that when Jesus hit the scene, he is love, so it only stands the reason that we would find out more about love in the New Testament. But think about, it, you know, most of the time that it's used, this is just a little bit of background, the word love that's used most of the time in the Old Testament is, is typically used in the book of Deuteronomy for the most part, and it's, and it's talking more about the commandments. But here we are as New Testament believers. So, so I, I got thinking about this this week. It's like, how did they love in the Old Testament? Could they love? It's a good question. Could they love? Now, if you have a generic translation of the word love, then the answer would be, of course they could. Because there's different words of love, right? There's There's... There's the, the word that's the, the ace in the hole, agape, or agape, however you want to pronounce it. And that's the love of God. That's a very specific kind of love. And that love, just to give a bit of background, is proactive. Everybody say proactive. 
in other words, it has to be initiated. Only stands, you know, when you think about it, how many of you know, even while we were yet sinners, God sent forth Jesus for us, right? He was proactive. In other words, God didn't wait on mankind to clean their act up before he did something. The love of God is proactive, which says, I'm going to love you no matter what you do or how you act. I'm still going to love you. Amen? Then the next one, the city of brotherly love, is found where? In Pennsylvania, the city's name is? Philadelphia, which comes from the Greek word phileo. That's a reactive love. In fact, all of the other loves, aside from agape, all of those kinds of love, they're reactive. Sutter scratches my back, I'll scratch his back. When he stops scratching my back, we're done. Are you with me? It's reactive. <clears throat> it's good, right? We can, we can love one another. In fact, the discourse that, that Jesus has with his disciples, love me, it's interesting how Jesus started out with the Greek word agape and ended up with phileo. So, so Old Testament, they could love one another to the best that a human can, right? How many of you know we, we don't need to be a Christian to be kind? Are you with me? There's people that don't know God, that don't like God, don't believe in God at all, that are still kind people, all right? And, and, and can act towards one another in a loving way, right? But this command, love one another to the degree that I've loved you, we need help doing that. In other words, it's not just possible on a human level. So let's go over to the book of Romans chapter 5. As New Testament believers, for the first time in human history, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we have an advantage, and more importantly, an ability. Everybody say ability. In other words, we can actually, we won't do it perfectly, so let's just get, that's, that's an of course. We won't do it perfectly. But we can fulfill that command because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's read in Romans. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which you stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces, produces character. Character produces hope. Now, hope that doesn't disappoint because, everybody say because, the love, this is agape, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's read that last part, because, starting in because. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit of God has come to dwell in our hearts. And when he arrives, <clears throat> he's filled with something that he gives, gives you and I. Um, when I was talking about that, I... I I thought about somebody, this, this will, so sorry for my imagination, my, my mind I know is kind of weird. There's, there's a few people that if I had a blindfold on and they walked in front of me, I could tell you who they were. Even if I had a blindfold on. <coughs> Do you know why? Because I could smell them. And for those people that I'm thinking of, their smell is a wonderful smell. And um, actually, uh, I came across somebody that I hadn't seen, 
in probably a couple years, happened to walk by, and I instantly went, that's him. I turned around and looked at him, and his back was to me, and I said, where have you been? He goes, how did you know it was me? I said, I smelled you. (laughs) (coughs) And I said, yes, it's good. I said, I don't know what cologne you wear, dude, but I tell you, I've known that smell for over 20 years. Okay, so just go with me here. When the Holy Spirit comes to reside in the, in the heart of a person who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, there's a fragrance that comes with that that should permeate everything. And one aspect of that fra- fragrance is the love of God. Are you with me? Now, let me ask you a question. Then why? So, I, I, I want you to walk in love at this statement. Then why in the world sometimes the smell that we smell out of Christians is rudeness? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's not talking about you. He's talking about someone else. <laughs> Shouldn't that fragrance of the Holy Spirit to just use that analogy, you know, every analogy breaks down at some point in time. I get that. But shouldn't the Spirit of God that dwells on the inside of us, shouldn't we exude some of that same smell? A.E., should we not be lovers of people? Amen? Then why do we allow triggers Why do we allow things to happen that when people are around us, they don't get that same smell? Are you with me? You ever been around a person that doesn't understand space, human space? (laughs) Right? Um, Sutter, you're good. Stand up. You stay down there so I can look you in the eye. (laughs) You ever been around those people that that when they're talking to you and they might have really bad breath? They just keep getting there and you take a step back and you go, or or you be the bad breath guy. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then say, yeah, you're good, good. Have you ever been around somebody like that, that they just don't understand space anymore? (laughs) And what do you want to do around people like that? Aside from hand them a toothbrush. You want them to just stop. It's like, stay there. I want to get away from you, right? Sometimes it's not bad breath. Sometimes it's just people skills, right? I'll never forget I was speaking in in, uh, Texas at a cowboy deal. And boy, this one guy, he was just right right up, just right up, and I'd take a step back, and he was just right up, just right up. And I finally just said, stop. I said, you stay right there. And I went like this in the carpet. I said, don't you dare cross that line. I said, "Uh -uh, stay on that line, on that line. I said, now, this is called space. Do not invade that space. And I can have a conversation with you. But if you want to cross that line, I'm out of here. He goes, is it really that bad? I said, it's worse. That's maybe kind of a funny analogy that maybe I think we ought to ask ourselves as Christians. Do we smell like the Holy Spirit that's been shed abroad in our hearts to where we, if I could say it this way, where we sweat love, the love of God? And quite honestly, you know, you've heard me say this before. One of the things that, that, one of the things I think that maybe was revealed during the COVID era, the onset of that, one of the things that it may have revealed is that we forgot that commandment. Are you with me? Okay, made some of you mad. I see it on your face. 
thing. He was doing good until he went there. How do, you, how do you say that? Why would you say that, Pastor? It's like, if we use a rubric, and listen, we're, we're, we're not to be judgmental, but if you use the most general rubric of loving people, there's a lot of things that people posted that would make me want to go. You stay there. I want to get far away from you. Are you with me? Is that fair? <laughs> okay. Made more of you mad than I thought. The point is, is if the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, the NRSV says poured, and what's interesting about that word is that that word is a word that is, it's not sparingly, but it's profusely, which means that it just keeps coming. Have you ever been filling up maybe, I don't know, a gas can or maybe something with oil and you didn't get the spigot shut off quick enough and it just kept running everywhere, right? That's the picture that this word brings out, is that the love of God has been lavishly poured out in our lives. In other words, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't just eked out it was just lavishly poured out. So that means that every believer, every Christian has the capacity. The reason I say capacity, I'll say it this way. Every believer has the potential. The reason I say potential or capacity, because how many of you know that capacity or operating at our potential are not necessarily the same thing? We have the capacity to love with the love of God, which, is, which isn't based upon a give and take sort of idea. It's not based on human love. It's not based upon reactions. It's not based upon people's belief system. It's not based upon whatever. It's based on the fact that there's a person that's made in the image and likeness of God, and outside of Jesus Christ, they're going to die and go to a devil's hell. Who of us as believers would ever want that? And if we allow a belief system or an action to cloud or distract our ability to love people, then shame on us, not shame on them. That's not an acceptance of, of, of whatever. That's just simply the deal that, that believers, well, I have such a hard time. I get it. We're human. But here's what I want to encourage us in. But we do have the Spirit of God on the inside of us and if we want to, we can love people with the love of God. And we can act towards people. And all you've got to look at is just simply look at the life of Jesus. And see how he interacted with people. Right? There's some people that he interacted with that, that had some lifestyles that were pretty crazy. Amen? We simply can't say, well, I just can't love so-and-so because you know how they, how they are. To say that as a rationale to not love is to deny the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling our heart. Amen? Go to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Verse 2, listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. So let's just stop there. Paul's addressing something within the infancy of Christianity. He's, he's addressing something that, that was pertinent. The, you know, the, by far the lion's share of, of the early church were people that came from a Jewish background, right? They came from the law. And so for, for quite a while, 
within the body of Christ. There was this, this uh, tension, would be maybe a, the best word. There was this tension that if, that if you obey the law, you're good to go. Because this Jesus thing is just a little bit out there, right? And so there were those that was, you know, Peter was one of the ones that would have initially in the book of Acts would have erred on the side of you got to do these things. You got to get circumcised still and all sorts of stuff. Paul comes along and what's interesting is Paul was the Jew of Jews. Next to Christ, he was the Jew of Jews. He was, he was trained by the, by the best rabbi of the day. And and Paul just said, listen, if, okay, if you go that route, if you think that you can be justified by obeying the law, good luck. But, but then as wisdom said, but I'm, I'm just here to tell you, it'll be impossible. Because Paul also one, is the one who wrote that said the law could save no man. All the law could do was simply bring front and center, face to face, that humanly speaking, you can't do it. This is the same thing about love, folks. I understand that there's things that maybe we come across in our world, depending upon where you're from and what your, what, what your, what your sensitivities are and maybe even what your triggers are. I understand there's some, there's some situations that are really difficult to go, I don't think I can love. My, my response is, you can't. In and of yourself, we can't. It's just, it will only become clear we just can't, right? Because the arm of flesh will always fail us. But what I think is really important is then to not just stop there. Well, I just can't do it. Don't stop there. Because all you're simply saying is something that's obviously true. In your flesh, you can't. Okay, now that you got that out of the way, now jump forward and say, but I can because... The Spirit of God indwells me, and I'm going to have to submit this to the Lord, and He's going to have to help me do this. Amen? That scenario, we then might have the ability to successfully do that. So you who want to be justified by the law have cut yourself off from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. Okay. I would just say that as a New Testament believer. If, if, you, just want to, if you just want to look at how people are and what they do. If that's what you want to look at, I just want you to know you're going to never be able to love people the way Jesus said we could. He said, for through the Spirit. Everybody say, through the Spirit. Ah. Or if I could say it this way, or because of the Holy Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, for in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts, look at this, is faith which works by love. So the Holy Spirit's indwelling in our life. We talk about a lot in charismatic circles and maybe even some of you came out of a Pentecostal world. We, we have these pictures in our head of what it means to be a spirit-led Christian or a spirit-filled Christian. And that, that brings to mind, you know, maybe different things or whatever it may be. But I think one of the things that we sometimes fail to bring to the forefront is our love for people. I believe that spirit-filled, spirit-led, charismatic, whatever you want to say, Christians ought to be the most loving people in the whole world. I believe they ought to be the most loving. Amen? Well, I ain't going to ever agree. I never ask you that. Right? Whenever you go there, it's amazing how you can see people just tense up. The, the wranglers, somebody grabs a hold of their belt and makes their wranglers way too tight. I believe Christians that are led by the Spirit of God, that are Spirit-filled, ought to be the most loving people in the whole world. Do you believe that? I believe that we ought to. I know some of you are going, well, yeah, but you know what? Okay, we are either going to live in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, or we're going to live by the letter of the law. You can't do both. 
Well, in the Old Testament, if somebody did something, they were stoned. Okay. Cool. But we're not Old Testament. Are you with me? Well, I ain't ever going to agree. Okay, you don't have to. Can you love? And our answer should be, I absolutely can. Because the Spirit of God has been shed abroad in my heart and when he came, he lavishly, profusely poured out the love of God. So then think about what that looks like, right? I mean, there's ways that people can act that we can just look at, and we don't have to be a rocket science and, and just ask, was that loving? Are you with me? And if it's not, then let's change. Y'all are getting so quiet. Do you want me to just be done? Let's look at Peter, and we're going to close with this. So here's Peter prior to the influence of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew 26, it's found there, verse 35. Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Forty verses later, Peter remembered the word after he already denied him three times. Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. You say, what does this have to do with love? It's a principal issue. Prior to the Holy Spirit's indwelling of Peter's life, Peter probably tried the very best that he could in his human strength. And for whatever reason, he ended up denying him after the influence of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. Peter just got done uh, you know, preaching a sermon that was very short. Peter said to them, they, they asked him, they said, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of, sin, of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Acts 5, 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking the word, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all, all those who heard the word. My point being is this. It's not a new thing in a Christian church to hear a message on that we need to love people, right? But when we delve into it and realize that that commandment that Jesus gave is a qualified commandment, that we're love people with the love of God the way he did. Now we're faced with, can we do it? Should we do it? Whatever. And I say, we can't get away from the commandment. But then I also say that if we try to do it just in our human flesh, we're going to fail. It's just, it's just, it's, it's too high of a bar. But with the fact that the Holy Spirit's been shed abroad in our hearts and with it brings copious amounts of the love of God, then I say we can do it. And we should do it. Amen? under all circumstances, regardless of the situation, I think we can if we try. Are we going to do it perfectly? No, we're not. But let's, let's, let's not fail because we didn't try. Amen? Cool. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. <clears throat> if you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> Or I get, want to give you an opportunity to come back to the Lord if that's maybe where you're at. So think about it for a moment. Anybody that's maybe watching on screen, I want you to think about it as well. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or maybe you've walked away from God and you, you know, there's something that's just drawing you out, whatever that sense maybe that you, if you feel that you need to come back, that's the, that's the love of God through the person of the Holy Spirit that's, that's making you feel so with their heads bowed and their eyes closed I'm just going to ask for a, an acknowledgement by raising of the hand um, 
I'm not going to then call you up separately or anything like that. I'm going to have us all stand. We're all going to pray together. A prayer that will get you into the family of God, welcome you back to the family of God, or keep you in the family of God. So is there anyone here this morning, by lifting your hand, you'd say, I'm not a Christian, I want to be, or you would say, I want to come back and get right with God. Would you just lift your hand anywhere across this sanctuary? I'll just look around. Okay, let's all stand up. I want us to pray. If you raised your hand and I didn't see it, mean it from the bottom of your heart. God will meet you there. Anybody that's watching on a screen, pray this and the Lord will meet you there as well. For all of us in here that's in the sanctuary that, you know, the majority just are are doing good, let's just use this prayer as an opportunity to just affirm, Jesus, I'm in. You're my Lord. I want to walk with you all the days of my life. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, would you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? I submit myself to you, and I need you. I want to live for you, Lord, all the days of my life. So thank you for loving me, for forgiving me, and accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.